You know, it's easy to start something. If you're in a race, it's easy to start a race, but you need to finish too. <laughs> now, 2 Timothy chapter 4, we've been looking at uh, a lot of things here, and the, the charge is what it, he started with in verse 1, I charge thee. And the reason he was charging them is because of chapter 3, verse 1, he says, in the last days perilous times shall come. In uh, verse 13, he said, Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. And he said, you, you need to be living for the Lord, living by faith. In uh, chapter 4, verse 1, he says, I charge thee. And he says, preach the word. And he says, the time will come when they won't listen. So do now what, uh, what needs to be done. And then in, in chapter 4, verse 6, we looked at the urgency. He said, I'm now ready. And he, he was doing then, in his situation, what he could do for the Lord. He knew that his time was, was coming to an end. And so in verse 7, he, he looked at the past. I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Then he, he looked at the resulting future. You know, we're going to be judged for what we do. And henceforth, verse 8, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. So a lot of things that we've, we've looked at. Now let's, let's read starting in verse 9. Let me read on down through verse 18. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed into Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, but especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will Preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. We'll just stop reading there. Uh, he, he's coming to the end of his ministry. This is the last book Paul, Paul wrote that God used him to, to write. And uh, this is very personal stuff here at the, at the end, isn't it? Uh, he was lonely. You know, he was pretty much on his own. I've always felt sorry for Luke. He says, only Luke is with me. <laughs> I know he didn't mean it in a bad way, but you can imagine he said, now, only Brad's with me, you know, <laughs> only Alex is with me. <laughs> yeah, he didn't mean it like that. Luke was a very, very faithful man, but, uh, you know, he was going through it, through a lot. It, it must have been, uh, prisons weren't then what they are now. I can guarantee you there was no colored television. Uh, he was forsaken. They used the word, uh, others had departed. You know, it wasn't that they forsook him, but they just had things they had to do. Others were sent. He talks about in, in verse 12. He sent this man to, to do something. Only Luke is with me. Uh, there was needs that he had. Uh, verse 13, uh, he, he needed his coat. Winter was coming on, it said in verse, uh, verse 21. That we haven't read it yet. Do thy diligence to come before winter. I'm going to need that coat. Um, very personal. In uh, Paul's writings, I'm told, I haven't counted them all, but I'm told that over 100 people are listed by name. And when he ends a book, he'll often talk about different ones. I counted 17 here. You can, don't, don't do it during the sermon, but uh, you can count them yourself if you want to. And in this chapter, I see some types of people. And uh, we can learn a lesson from them. One is Demas. Do you notice him there in verse 10? Demas hath forsaken me. And he gives the reason having loved this present world and has departed into Thessalonica. Demas typifies quitters. You know, people who start but don't, don't finish. Now, we don't know everything about Demas. Uh, Paul says he, he left because he loved this present world. That's right. now, rather than loving the Lord, he, he loved the world. And, you know, quite often that's, that's the reason. Uh, in 1 John, it, it does mention this. It says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued. Now, sometimes people leave, you know, they get into church, they get into Christian circles, but they're not Christians. 
and, and it makes it, it's just always a rub and it's always hard for them. And when they leave, I had one man tell me he felt so much better when he left, left our church, quit going to church altogether. Uh, you know, that, that's just the way it is sometimes. But be careful because when a person is saved, they can get backslidden. And uh, that could have been um, Demas, we, we don't know. But First John talks about love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Uh, that was what happened to Demas. We don't want to be like Demas. Uh, don't, don't quit. Don't quit the Lord. But then you also see some people who are what I would call pioneers. And he talks about Crescens, the end of verse 10, and, and Titus. Now, these are people who went off. They had other works that God had called them to do. And you know, that happens. Sometimes the best person in your church, God will call and, and send them somewhere else. <laughs> That's just the way it is, you know. Uh, cream rises to the top, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, God calls people. You just get them useful and off they go, you know. Uh, serve the Lord somewhere else. And you're, gra you're grateful to God, you know, that God would call someone for you, from your ministry. You know, I think as a, as a pastor, uh, you need to be careful you're not holding people too tight. You know, God calls people to do different things, and you don't want to oppose what, what God is doing. Now, these people, I believe, were going to new works. Uh, Titus had spent a lot of time with Paul. Uh, for instance, uh, let me just read you a few verses. He was with Paul in Jerusalem. Uh, toward the beginning of Paul's ministry, Galatians 2.1 says, 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. Uh, that was pretty early days in, in Paul's ministry. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, it says that Titus was with him in Macedonia. Um, it says, we were coming to Macedonia. He said, our flesh had no rest. We were troubled. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. God had been using Titus in, in, in Paul's life. Uh, later on, Titus was in Corinth. 2 Corinthians 7, 13. He says, we were exceeding, uh, therefore we were comforted in your comfort. Yea, and exceeding more joyed ye through the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. They were obviously from the south, these people. Uh, you all have been helping us out there. And he said, Titus is refreshed by the Corinthians. So he'd been in, in Corinth. Uh, and then, of course, the book of Titus, he was the pastor in Crete. Titus 1, verse 5, For this cause left I thee in Crete. He's writing to Titus. Uh, Titus had been doing a lot of things. But now at this point in 2 Timothy, we see he's being sent to Dalmatia. You know where Dalmatia is? It's Yugoslavia. He went as a, a missionary to Yugoslavia. He probably had a basketball team. I mean, they're, they're tall. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's, that's the kind of person. And, and you need those in, in your ministry. You need those in your church. People that God reaches down and calls them, and, and, and they're a blessing uh, when they're with you. They're a blessing as they, they go and, and serve the Lord in other places. The third kind of person is typified by Luke and, and Tychicus. I don't know if I'm saying his name right. I'll ask him when we get to heaven, but uh, Luke is, I know. Uh, these are stalwart supporters. Only Luke is with me. You know, here's the guy that, you know, he's just there. Uh, and the tendency, the problem with people like this is you tend to overlook them. They're so faithful, they just become like part of the furniture. And boy, they're a blessing. You know, you lose this kind of person, you, you've really lost a, a lot. And Ephesians uh, chapter 6, now not just Luke, but uh, Tychicus as well. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 21 talks about him when he says, But that ye also may know my affairs and how I do, Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things. It's interesting, the end of that chapter in Ephesians, he says, written from Rome under the Ephesians by Tychicus. <laughs> he, was a, he was a real helper to, to Paul. In um, Colossians chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, we're just talking about about people tonight. Uh, you know, God blessed Paul through, through these people. Colossians 4, verse 7, he says, All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and a fellow servant in the Lord. For the same I've sent him unto you for the same purpose. Here was this faithful fellow that Paul could trust to, uh, to send here and send there and do things that would be a blessing. 
Uh, Titus chapter 3, verse, verse 12 mentions him when he says, When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me. Okay. Here, here's these people that are just faithful men. Listen, a church cannot function without faithful people. You know, a church is not just something you go to and sit and watch a show. Uh, I know Abraham Lincoln, he, he was a church goer. He said he, he liked to see a preacher preach like he was fighting bees. <laughs> he, really, he wanted to see him have a go, you know. But, you know, the church is not just a show. Uh, I'm not going to jump on the pulpit and run around and bark and, you know, do things to entertain you. Uh, God's got to speak to our hearts, doesn't he? We've got to come because we love the Lord. We've got to have faithful people like Luke and, and Tychicus. Uh, we see Demas. He was a quitter. Crescens and Titus. They were pioneers. God called them out and, and sent them out. Luke and Tychicus, stalwart, faithful people. But then you see another fellow. Uh, what, let's see, where am I? It's Mark, verse 11. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he's profitable profitable to me for the ministry. Now, just reading that, you wouldn't know this, but Mark is the person who represents a second chance. Uh, Mark had failed as a missionary. He'd gone with Paul and Barnabas, and then he quit. And uh, when they went to go again, Barnabas said, let's, let's take Mark again. Paul said, no way, we're taking that quitter. <laughs> and uh, they, they had a disagreement, and, and they, they went their separate ways. But obviously, at this point, Mark had proved himself to be faithful. Listen, every one of us is going to fail at some point, in one way or another, some more obvious than others, but we all need a second chance, and we all need to take that second chance. Don't think that because there's a failure that God can't do something with you. Now, sometimes we'll limit our ministries because of, of failures, but listen, you go right through the scriptures, you see he's the God of the second chance. Think about David, King David. Man, he messed up big time. <laughs> God still used him. He, he repented. God didn't just use him in his sin. God used him because he repented. Uh, think of classic examples, Jonah. <laughs> Man, what a failure. God made sure everybody knew. Puked up out of a great fish. I mean, good grief. Peter. Here's Peter. Denies the Lord. And uh, God uses him. He, he preaches in uh, in Jerusalem, and, and thousands are saved. God, he's the God of the second chance. Uh, you know, people, people can be a blessing. People can also be a problem. Uh, that's why our reliance is on the Lord. Our reliance is not on ourselves. It's not on people. Uh, it's on the Lord. Pa Paul was involved with, with many people, and he was at a, a difficult time in his life. He also faced many problems. Some of those problems involve people. Did you notice Alexander there in verse 14? We don't know if this is the same Alexander that's mentioned in 1 Timothy, but probably is, maybe not. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. That's, kind of, that's a phrase I sometimes use in a funeral if I'm not sure if the person is saved or not. This person has gone to their reward. <laughs> uh, you you hate, kind of hate to say that, but uh, it's true. We're going to go to our, our reward. And he's saying that of, of Alexander. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou where also. And listen to this. For he hath greatly withstood our words. This wasn't just a troubled person. This is a person who was actively opposing the word of God. Alexander the, the coppersmith. Uh, Paul faced that problem. He also faced, did you see there in verse 16, all, all men forsook me. That's the same word, the same phrase he uses uh, in, uh, it, when he talks about Demas in verse 10. Demas hath forsaken me. So these weren't just people who just didn't happen to be there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> my, my power pack just fell out. <laughs> <laughs> these were people that purposely left when Paul needed him. He said... At my first answer, no man stood with me. All men forsook me. Um, that's tough to take. You know, when you're counting on people to be there and, and they're not. And that's going to happen. You know, the, the just sometimes people, what do we use the expression? They, they shoot through, you know. Um, he not only faced desertion and opposition. We haven't read it yet, but verse 20 says, Erastus abode at Corinth. 
But Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. He faced sickness, disease, amongst those he was working with. Now, stop and think about this. Paul was a healer. But Trophimus he left at uh, Miletum sick. You know, not everybody gets healed. Now, it's just the, the reality, isn't it? Uh, we pray for God's will. We pray for healing. Uh, we don't know. And we trust the Lord. Uh, we don't know what, uh, what happened with his sickness. But that, that would have been a, a difficulty that Paul would have been facing. Not only people, but I believe Paul is, is talking in the end of verse 17 about satanic opposition. He says, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Uh, th there's a lot of different theories as to what that represents. Uh, it could just be a lion, you know. But the problem with that is the Romans didn't normally put Roman citizens in with the lions. Uh, some people think it could refer to Nero. Now, I, personally, I think it refers to Satan. I think it's just an indirect reference. Like he, the Bible says in 1 Peter, uh, Be sober, be diligent for your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about. Uh, Satan is our adversary. And uh, you know, God is, is victorious, but uh, Satan is very powerful, and he wants to destroy us. He wants to use things. Particularly, he wants to stop the work of the gospel. Look at verse 17. He says, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, that all the Gentiles might hear. That's when he says, And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. You know, Paul's job was to present the gospel for people to know Jesus Christ. And Satan wants to stop that. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 13 that one of the jobs that Satan does is he snatches the Word of God out of people's hearts and minds. That's Matthew 13, 19. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. Uh, Satan doesn't want people to hear and understand the gospel. You know, I often hear people quote the Bible. You'll hear it often in, in literature and in, just in people talking. And usually they don't know even that it's from the Bible. Satan loves that. You know, uh, for people to quote the Bible and, and misuse it or not understand it, he doesn't mind that. He just doesn't want us understanding it. <laughs> That's why it's so important for us as Christians to hide it in our heart and, and, and read it and, and meditate on it and, and use it. And uh, to let God speak to us through His Word. Uh, Paul was, was facing many, many problems. Some of them were people. Some of them were satanic. Some of them were just sinful things. Verse 18, The Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and preserve me unto His heavenly kingdom. Uh, you know, there's just a lot of wickedness in our world. Uh, and it affects us. Uh, you know, Paul would have, would have had struggles with uh, temptations and so on. Some of our greatest battles will be with self. Now, Paul was facing personal difficulties, many problems with people, with Satan, with sin. But in all of this, his hope was in the Lord. There's a great word there in uh, verse 17, notwithstanding. <laughs> our second son, Philip, had a preacher he really liked to listen to, and he, he was famous for using the word nevertheless. <laughs> nevertheless. Well, this is that, that kind of word. Notwithstanding. You know, no matter what's going on, we can trust the Lord. That's what, what he's saying there. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known. Paul relied on the promises of God. This is a great example here. I mean, here he is in prison. He's about to be killed, and he's trusting the Lord. He was killed. His, his head was cut off because of his faith in Jesus Christ. But his faith was in the Lord. Let, let me show you four promises here, and then we'll be done. And no matter what, what the situation, if you're a Christian, verse 17, you have the promise of God's presence. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. Now, you know, theoretically, we know as Christians that God is omnipresent. But this is more than that. This is not just that God is everywhere. This is God is with me. I'm on the Lord's side. Uh, there's some wonderful promises in the Bible concerning this. In Hebrews 13, uh, verse 5, he says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. 
We have the promise of God's presence. In the Great Commission, lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. What a blessing. God is, is with us. Uh, you know, we, we see the, the 23rd Psalm. In the 23rd Psalm, we're the sheep. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Make me to lie down in green pastures. Yeah. Uh, his presence, he's our shepherd. That's God's promise. Secondly, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. There's the second promise. God, God has promised to, uh, to give us the strength that we need to face what we're facing. The example that came to my mind was when Paul had asked the Lord to take away a sickness in 2 Corinthians 12. You're probably familiar with that. He asked the Lord, and the Lord said, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. He said, Paul, I'm not going to take away your sickness, but I'm going to give you my strength in your sickness. Now, I don't understand why God does some things. Neither do you, I mean, qu quite frankly. But we know God is good. And we know as Christians we have the promise of His presence. We have the promise of His strength. Whatever we're facing, God says He'll, he'll see us through. You know, like when He told the disciples, get in the ship, we're going to the other side. You can count on it. They were going to the other side. <laughs> now, He didn't tell them we're going through a storm and it's going to be scary. Now, he didn't tell them that. And I'm glad God doesn't tell us everything. Right. Aren't, you, aren't you glad you don't know everything that's going to happen? Uh, you know, uh, God will see us through. We just need to trust Him as we go. We have the promise of His presence. We have the promise of His strength. And that strength in, in Paul's life had to do with he was able to do what God called him to do, which was to preach the gospel. You know, we, we read it there how he said that, By me the preaching might be fully known, that all the Gentiles might hear. We often use the verse, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. We use it, but we don't always actually believe it. <laughs> uh, we need to believe it. That's faith. Uh, Isaiah wrote, here, here's a good verse. I'd encourage you maybe to memorize this. Obviously, I haven't, though. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. We have God's promise of, of strength. Thirdly, His promise of His presence, His strength. Thirdly, His deliverance. Verse 17, at the end, He says, And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Verse 18, And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. Now understand this. God's deliverance doesn't always mean what you think it means. Uh, sometimes... Paul was delivered to prison. And that was his ministry there. I don't know if you've ever heard of a man named Richard Wormbrandt. He was a prisoner because of his faith in a communist country. And he served the Lord in that prison for, I don't know, quite a few years. And he said when he was released, he felt like, oh, I've lost my ministry. <laughs> he was delivered to that prison. And it wasn't easy. But he just trusted the Lord that God would see him through. Uh, you know, we need to understand that, that uh, life is not for us to decide. If, if we're going to trust the Lord, we need to trust him come what may. In 2 Corinthians 2.14, he says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Whatever we're facing, like Paul, uh, we know his presence, we know his strength, uh, we know his, his deliverance, giving us uh, what we, we need to face what we're facing. We sing a song, I Must Tell Jesus. One of the, the phrases is, Jesus can help me. Jesus alone. Yeah. Problem is, oftentimes we look for strength where there is none. Uh, Paul relied on God's presence. He relied on God's strength. He relied on God's deliverance. And then finally, verse 18, he relied on, on God's preservation. The Lord shall deliver me from every work and will preserve me unto His heavenly kingdom. I found it interesting. Words are interesting. And this word, it's exactly the same word as in Romans 10, 13, when he says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, preserved. You know, I hadn't really thought about it in that way. Preserve. You know, when you're preserving something, you're saving it. We're going to use that later. Well, God has promised to preserve us. 
He doesn't say, I'll preserve you in this way or that way, but he says, I've got a heavenly place prepared for you. It's the same word as in Ephesians 2.8. For by grace are you saved, preserved, through faith. My question to you tonight is, are you saved? When he says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, have you called on the name of the Lord? For by grace are you saved through faith. Have you believed God's word? Have you trusted him? Uh, remember, it's by faith. He says it's not by works of righteousness. You, you know, the world will try to deceive you. Oh, you're all right. Don't worry about it. No, God says you, you need to be concerned about your soul. You need to make sure that, that you're saved. You know, there's, there's many uh, dangers and disappointments in life. But as Christians, we know this. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. You know, what a blessing uh, to know that we're preserved. Uh, if they take our life, we're, we're preserved. We're saved. We're on our way to heaven. Uh, you know, people will fail us. I won't have a raise of hands, but uh, I mean, we've all been failed at one time or another. And listen, we've been the person who's failed. We'll fail others. Satan and sin afflict us all. The key is decide which side you're on and then trust the Lord and serve Him. Just keep trusting the Lord and, and serving Him. Uh, Jesus doesn't fail. Cling to His unchanging hand. Don't presume that you know more than God. Uh, Paul going through all this, and yet he's able to say, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, preserved me, delivered me. All of those things are true. Let me, let me read the last part of this chapter. There's a lot of interesting names. Salute Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. Do thy diligence to come before winter. Eubulus greeteth thee and Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brethren. Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. I want you to particularly see verse 22. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. We have that promise. He said he'll never leave us or forsake us. We need to Use the power of the presence of the Lord in our lives, no matter what we're, we're facing. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Let's, let's take our songbooks. We're going to go to page 182. Jesus never fails. Get the uh, 